I'm Carmine Gallo with entrepreneur and author Pyle Kadakia. She started Class Pass, which is a company now valued at more than a billion dollars. And she is also author of the book Life Pass, where she brings together her experiences to help everybody drop their limits and rise to their potential. Pyle, you have a an inspiring story. So I'm glad you're sharing it. Thank you so much for having me, Carmine. You graduated from MIT and like others in your class who went into either banking or consulting, you went into consulting for a prestigious consulting firm, but you say it wasn't your calling. What is the distinction between a passion and a calling? Because I think it's an important difference. Absolutely. So I found my passion when I was really young, which was Indian dance, and it was something that I love to do. I think a lot of us have passions in our lives, things that make us feel good when we do them, whether it's playing, you know, playing the piano, going on doing athletics, any of these things that really give us a sense of a feeling of thriving, right? I think the distinction with a calling is it's in service of other people, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is really the thing that is really different. And honestly, while dance to me was this passion, it turned into a calling for me because it led me to be able to help other people, right? And that's truly what is the difference. And I think is so important when we think about companies, right? When we think about things that we do in our lives, it's not just about the things we love. It's about the things we love, thinking about how they are impacting other people because we all were put on earth to really be in service of one another. That's a good point. I like that distinction because it sounds like dance, Indian dance, or you were really, you were obsessed with it. It's yeah. a joy. It's a love for you. But in 2013, I believe around the time you were starting class pass, you found the experience of finding a dance class uh, to be a frustrating one and class pass was born. So it sounds like the success is a combination of an obsession and a deep love for, for something, a mission combined with skills. You had skills. You had started a dance company and you had spent years for a consulting company. So success is this combination of obsession plus skills combined to solve a real world problem. Yeah. Do you think I'm close to a formula? <laughs> I think you're getting there. And I love the addition of the real world problem. It's funny when I meet entrepreneurs today and they ask me, you know, hey, will you invest in my company? The first two questions I always ask is what problem in the world are you solving? And how will you know when you've solved it? And those are two questions that a lot of times people can't, under can't actually answer. Yeah, that second part shocking. is hard. I know. And to be honest, I didn't know in the beginning of class that's either. It took me a little bit to realize how I knew I would have solved it. And Ultimately, after failing many times, making a lot of mistakes, and then finally seeing it come to life and seeing people go to class, I realized my reservation number and seeing people actually doing the thing I wanted them to do was the magic of it all. And I knew that was the actual solution I was looking for. And so sometimes it takes a little bit to get there. But like I said, I was out to solve a problem. And when you are out to solve a problem, you don't let things stand in your way, right? So going back to what you were saying, of course, you can have the skills, you can have a master plan of a business idea, all of that. But it's that will to say, I'm going to keep going until I've solved this problem that's going to get you through it all. I think that obsession is really important and that mission is important. And here's why. Early in class pass, it was... Um, it was hard for you. It wasn't, it didn't take off quite as well as you had hoped very early on in it. And you also discovered a, you're going to, you call it a lack of a skill, uh, okay. but I think it was your, your superpower. But early on, you said you were not a natural born salesperson. And here's what you write in your book. I've never considered myself a natural born salesperson and that's fine, except when it became a requirement to get class pass off the ground. I think that's a very common experience for a lot of entrepreneurs who have an idea. Well, then tell us, Pyle, how did you become comfortable selling your idea when you yourself felt that you weren't extra, maybe naturally uh, a natural, a natural born salesperson? And, you know, I had seen other people in my life who were great at sales, right? It was this idea where they could literally sell any product to you. What I realized is I could only sell something I truly believed in. And that was just 
either a flaw or a great characteristic. As you said before, it was one of those things that I always knew about myself. If it wasn't authentic and if it didn't feel comfortable to me, I wasn't going to be able to lie about it or not even lie, but I wasn't going to be able to like sugarcoat it with a bunch of different, you know, stats and stories. So for me, it came down to finding that authentic thread. And so I realized when I needed to go and sell class pass to a bunch of studio owners, the most comfortable setting and thing I can do was go to take a class because that made me feel very comfortable being in my leggings, working with the teacher, and then afterwards being able to sit down with them in an environment that felt very comfortable. I didn't feel like it was a forced conversation to be able to say, hey, I have something to tell you. I truly care about getting you more customers. Here's my idea. Here's my plan. It started just flowing in a much more authentic way because I didn't feel like I was selling them on something. I truly felt like I was helping them. That's fascinating. So you put yourself in their environment, you learned about their classes, you took their classes. That was part of your journey in convincing studios and boutiques to join the membership program that you had started. Exactly. It was really about changing it for them too, right? Not having potentially like someone walking in in a suit or calling them and pitching them on something. It was really a girl who was their customer, literally through and through coming and saying, Hey, I have an idea. Will you sit down and listen to me? And many of them were like, great, I would love to help. And this sounds wonderful. Let me, let me let's see how this goes. And in the beginning, it's a lot of trial and error. Right. But I think we felt like the story was so authentic for both of us. And we were trying to figure it out together. It wasn't a one-sided relationship. And that's really what helped it to thrive. You mentioned a phrase that I hadn't thought about before. I like it. Uh, an authentic thread, find an authentic thread. Well, most people are not selling a product or a service or a company that they started. That's very right. rare. How do I find an authentic thread in my job? I think when you look at who you're talking to, we're all human. Humans feel, we have emotions. We all have stories behind us. And I think the best thing you can do is truly connect with people. I actually talk about this in the, in the book, but at Bain, I used to have to do a lot of cold calling, right? So I used to actually do telemarketing research when I was younger as like a job I had in high school. And I always just had this really great way of getting people on the phone. And it was because I didn't start with like, hey, hi, I'm calling you, will you take a survey? You know, it's really about like, hey, how's your day going? Like what's going on, you know? And someone's like, wait, who is this? And everyone kind of wants to talk to somebody. So I think it's about really finding a way to get into that connected feeling with someone, someone else, and whether you're selling them. I mean, this is, this is for anything in life really, right? Is how do you find that connection that feels real? And you'd be surprising when you're willing to be a bit more open and friendly, how people will reach back to you and do the same. Four years after starting class pass, you were invited to present at the massive Dreamforce conference, the Salesforce conference in San Francisco. And you brought dancers from your dance company to perform before your speech. And it was a clever way of demonstrating your love for Indian dance and your love of technology and how it inspired you to create class pass, that combination. I think that was very creative and very clever. You're a storyteller, aren't you? I am. And I think all of that really truly came from my passion for dance that gave me a place to belong and a place to tell my story from because I looked around when I was growing up and I didn't look like everyone else, you know, and I even in the business world didn't look like everyone else. And I wanted to find a way to not fit in. You know, I tried that for a very long time and I realized that didn't make me feel good. I needed to find a way to share my story confidently. And as, you know, class class was growing and as I was speaking at more things, I loved this opportunity to be able to share both because I was sharing my full self on that stage. It wasn't some part of me, right? The business side of me or not the creative side of me or the American version of me and not the Indian. I felt like I was fully who I was on that stage and it made me feel comfortable. And I know it inspired everyone else to be able to see somebody truly be all threads of who they are in one place. Do you have any advice for people graduating from business school, recent graduates, entrepreneurs, or aspiring leaders when it comes to selling yourself and selling your ideas? So I think when you have an idea to be an entrepreneur, right, first of all, 
it's really not about the product idea, right? It is really about the mission. So going back to the first thing we were talking about, what problem are you solving? And also, why are you the right person to be solving it, right? We don't talk about founder market fit that much. We talk about product market fit a lot. But, you know, in my case, and I know this, and a lot of people have talked about it, I had such great founder market fit, right? Like what person out there would have the combination of the experience I had, but then be obsessed with going to class every single day to have come together to have solved this problem. And I think you have to think about it in the same way. It's not just, let me look at all my peers and all my peers are starting companies in this world. So let me do the same thing. It is, what is it that uniquely makes you fit to be solving the problem you're going to be or the idea you're going to be. And don't be an entrepreneur just because everyone else is. Be an entrepreneur because like I said, you really want to go and solve something. Yeah, I believe that you said that uh, early on in the uh, class pass in your company, uh, again, early on, it wasn't taken off quite as well as you had hoped. And you said that the only reason why you got through those early stages, those early hurdles, is because you were 100% focused on your mission a mission that you care deeply about. And then you write, if I had cared 1% less, I would not have had the resilience to keep fighting. And I think that speaks to the power of mission. 100%. I was mission obsessed. I was not going to stop until people went to class. And I think that is what gave ClassPass the resilience it needed to get through all those early pivots, to get through so many of the biz business pivots that we did later in our lives, the pandemic. That mission stays with your company through and through. You know, It's been a decade. And I think when we think about that, it's really because we never lost sight of what that mission and vision was. It's been the same since day one. I think when you waver on that, you get lost, right? And so then when there's different trees that are falling in front of you, it's hard to remember what the true north is. But when you know the true north, it becomes easier to say, okay, I got to navigate this roadblock in this way, because you will face roadblocks. We all know that entrepreneurship is not an easy road for anyone. Um, but I think the resilience truly comes from that mission and that pivoting that we did as a company. It wasn't me being obsessed with a product idea. And, and by the way, I, I say this all in hindsight, right? I think it's important for me to mention that for any entrepreneurs who are listening. I learned this by making a mistake, right? And that's why I'm saying this to you because I don't want other people to make the same mistake. I spent a year building a beautiful product thinking it was going to work because Open Table had done this in restaurants and ZocDoc had done this for dentists and doctors, but I was off. Like I did not understand my industry enough to be able to just apply a different model. I had to go back to really truly what I knew about my industry to be able to apply it versus copying another business model. And so when I started doing that, that's really when the magic started forming because I started listening truly to my industry combined with great business ideas and business models to create something, honestly, that had never been created before, right? There had been never been a subscription for these sort of like offline classes at the time in this fragmented base. And so we kind of invented an entire new business model by thinking differently and moving on our mission, not just getting stuck on a product idea. Quickly remind me, what was the mission of ClassPass when you first started it now about a decade ago? The mission, um, because finding a class shouldn't be harder than taking one. What's that? It was because but, finding a class shouldn't be harder than taking one. Oh, finding a class would be harder than taking shouldn't one. Yes. Be harder than taking one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was sort of our, our born our again, born out of that frustration that you yeah, experienced personally. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's really where we were. It's obviously, you know, it's gotten only bigger than that, you know, and I, I think that this is sure. also really important. Your mission and vision can, can evolve and get bigger. Like I mm -hmm. think I earned the right to make it bigger. So our vision statement now is every life fully lived, which is obviously a bit grander than like where it started with like more of solving a problem. But I think you're allowed to do that as you keep going towards it. And it's all in the same vein, but it's still very allied to aligned to more hours of people's lives doing great things that they're passionate about. You mentioned, this is an important distinction. You mentioned having a North Star, having a mission that you're 100% committed to. I also think that as a company grows, it's up to the person in charge or the people at the top to articulate that mission yes. consistently and remind people of that mission. It sounds like that's what you did as you were building ClassPass. Yeah. And you know, there were times where we were growing really fast and new people were hired and all of a sudden I felt like no one knew what it was anymore, right? Because you have to find time 
to cultivate it into the system, right? And I think one of the strongest things we were able to do is we hired a lot of people who were obsessed with the product and were using it. We'd had a lot of people saying, I love this thing so much. Can I come and help? Whether it was in customer service, even engineers. And I think that helped a lot, but it did always remind me as a leader, there came a point where I was like, I need to redefine this, right? We're, we're becoming bigger. We're not a fitness company. We're a lifestyle company. And even that distinction for a lot of people was, was really, you know, something that was hard to digest because while we're a fitness company, I'm like, we're very different than people trying to solve the 1% of the fitness market. We're trying to make fitness accessible, which is actually a very different part of the market and a different brand. So you have to constantly keep thinking about it and making sure that your team knows what that true north is. Finally, full disclosure. I know that you love Indian dance. I love Bollywood movies. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love it. Which what is my, my wife and I <laughs> like these movies that Netflix now continues to feed us. Yeah, I thought that was only on mine. I'm glad that's on everyone. Darn it! I love those movies. <laughs> Explain something. Isn't Bollywood dance different than Indian classical dance, or is yeah. it the same? Bollywood no, they're dance. Very different. They're okay, very different. they are because yeah, I like. I mean, then I like the Bollywood dancing, but isn't it inspired by classic? Indian dance? Yeah. So, you know, Indian classical dance is ancient, right? And it comes from obviously, you know, a very, very historic part of India. Um, the training of it is more like ballet, right? Like you wouldn't call ballet the same thing you're kind of seeing on TV, right? In a more commercialized setting. Um, so it's very different, right? You, the training in an Indian classical form is like a dedication of a lifetime, the same way ballet is. Bollywood dancing is obviously like a lot more fun. It's a lot more about the movie and the storytelling that people yes. do. So Maybe that's like why I like it. It's you know? part of, I think that's why I like it. It's part of the story. It's a yeah, joyous it's, part, it's, but it's part of the storyline. Well, that is actually a critical part of all Indian classical dance too. So there is one part of Indian dance that always is about Abhinaya, which is about expression. And so Indian dance is actually rooted in it where you, you know, you, whether it's your hands that are telling a story, your face that's telling a story, which mm. makes it actually really unique. And I think what people really love when they watch it is because they can feel so much, right? Whether they understand the words or not, I think that's actually what makes it so engaging for an audience. Well, I love it. So, and I can see why you love it as well. I just wasn't sure if I should disclose that, you know, when someone calls 100%. and I say, why not? That's well, great. I, I can't that. make that meeting now because I'm, I'm watching, I'm really hooked on this Bollywood. And movie. they're three hours long, right? So. Oh, they're, they're, all, they're super long. Oh, uh, so uh, Paul Kadakia, thank you very much. It's really nice meeting you and congratulations on Life Pass. I, I hope entrepreneurs read it, but anyone who is in their, especially early stages of a career as well. I think it's very important. It's a good career book. Not sure if you had that in mind, but I think it's really aimed for people who are struggling with finding their passion, their role and where they fit in, in their yeah. careers. I think it's uh, about everyone just really living the life that they truly want to. And that can be being an artist. That could be being in business. It doesn't matter. It's just, it should feel authentic to you. And no one really teaches us how to make those decisions for, you know, in our own lives. We're sort of taught it by society and that's not always the best marker for our own selves. Excellent. Thank you, Pyle. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Pyle Kadakia. She combined her passion and a mission to start a company. Class Pass, and within a decade, it was valued at more than $1 billion. It's a very inspiring story. For more inspiring interviews and educational videos, go ahead and subscribe to Carmine Gallo TV. So next time you'll be notified. Thanks for watching.